Vamos a seguir con la segunda sesión, que como habréis visto en el programa se llama Arquitectura Contemporánea contra la Globalización. Y realmente ese era el planteamiento de este segundo grupo de, de conferencias que se va a prolongar en la mañana de, de mañana. Y lo que vais a ver son una serie de arquitecturas, que son arquitecturas absolutamente actuales, pero que están... Eh, arraigadas y crecen y se desarrollan desde la tradición de los sitios donde, donde está trabajando cada uno de estos arquitectos. Espero que disfrutéis cada uno de los ejemplos que, que os van a mostrar. Os dejo primero con Alice Agassi, que es un arquitecto muy prolífico, tiene una obra espectacular, él tiene su estudio en Londres y, y creo que lo que enseñará hoy será buena muestra de ello. Thank you. Uh... Good morning, or is it just just before afternoon? Um, thank you very much, Alejandro, for inviting me, and thank you, uh, Senor Manzano Martos, uh, for inviting me and uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about our work. <coughs> I think there was a there was a bit of a confusion about what I was going to talk about, but I think uh, the, the, there was a provisional title in the uh, in the. Oh, excuse me, also for speaking English. I, I don't speak your beautiful language, but I, I'm trying. The, uh, the, there was a slight confusion in, in, in the title of my lecture, in each, uh, and I, uh, there was one version of it which read The Angst of the Modernist Architect. But uh, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm probably going to talk about the angst of the classicist and the traditional architect. Um, and uh, and uh, we will see which angst is worse. It's always a competition between us modernists and uh, between the classicists and the modernists. Um, Basically, I, I think the, 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 the issue and, and, the, and the, uh, the, the, the main theme of the conference is actually central to the work of our practice because we are um, essentially um, um, following a, a, a philosophy which really is to do uh, with local identity, is distinguishing between what is classical and what is vernacular. And architecture as a global practice today is uh, presenting lots of dilemmas, not just to people who follow traditional and classical architecture, but also to modernists. Uh, I mean, the fundam fundamental to our belief is that really, as there are as many vernacular uh, uh, styles of architecture, we believe that there are also many classicisms. But they have things in common and things in contrast, which uh, probably needs to uh, be explored. I mean, we practice in different parts of the world. We have projects in Russia in uh, uh, Spain, in uh, continental Europe. Uh, we haven't conquered the United States yet, but that, that's an ambition. <laughs> and I'm still young, I think. Um, <coughs> and you can see, really, this is like a, a, a sort of a vignette of our, our various projects in different parts, in Croatia, Romania, Scotland, Spain, Kuwait. Um, and, and practicing in all these localities really uh, takes a, a kind of a, a specific attitude Uh, uh, and, and what I'm going to try and describe is this attitude and how that actually informs the work. And the attitude is definitely not this. I think this, this, this you might think is actually a joke, but it is not. It is actually the front page, uh, that, that top image, which says we are guided by the sensitivity to the culture and climate of a place. That is actually the front page of a website of a very famous architect, uh, actually a star architect. And, uh, and <coughs> basically, you can see immediately the kind of the two sensibilities uh, that, that are juxtaposed together. Uh, you know, you can see that this climate obviously is a, is a, is a cold climate because of the chimneys, uh, and, but you, see don't, you don't see any, any sign of any kind of uh, uh, masonry on the building. You see uh, expanses of glass. You see the scale of the chimneys, but there's no scale to the building itself in the background. So this kind of schism is actually taken Uh, as, as given, and you know, if people just go past these images and they, go, they actually see this seriously on the front of a website of a, of a major architect without really batting an eyelid, whereas it is totally shocking, to me at least. And the other, the other uh, kind of le uh, uh, spectrum of, of how this kind of architecture is not just standing next to, but trying to invade and occupy the buildings uh, which are of the past, Uh, is you know projects of that nature that you see at the bottom. Uh, I think somebody has termed these as parasite buildings. A parasite, by definition, is an organism that attaches itself to something uh, else and tries to live off it. 
um, and, and, and to gain sustenance from it. <coughs> but uh, eventually it will kill it. Um, and, and I think there is really probably, if there is an angst of, of modernists, is this, where by there is, uh, it, it must be very difficult, as I, I've said it a number of times before, to be a modernist architect because you have so much richness, even if you take a town like Madrid, there's so much culture, so much uh, richness of architectural history and building that it must be totally intimidating if you go into that context with your philosophy having to defy the context, because that's your philosophy if you're a modernist, having to ignore completely the, 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 the way buildings should be built or were built in the 19th century or the early 20th century, and having to defy everything. And it, it must give you nightmares, but at least we classicists don't have that. And really, the, the, the other issue is, is uh, what is happening to culture, locality, and sense of place. Uh, again, you, know, you can see, if, if you were to take out the names of all of these various places, you know, you've got Houston at the bottom, you've got Dubai on the right, you've got Big Ben surmounted on top of a skyscraper building in Dubai, and then, uh, the, 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 and then you know, people really have become accustomed to this shock, um, which, which is, you, know, you go into an environment where the outside temperature is 50 degrees C, and you walk into a shopping mall and you have an alpine ski slope. And, and within that, there's also a chalet, and not only that, they offer fondue and hot chocolate. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, so that there is this totality of experience also, which, is, you know, uh, which goes side by side. It's like a thematic uh, that goes side by side. And also, you could even break your leg if you wanted to on the slope on the way down. And, and as I said, always, the exit is always not as glamorous as being lifted up with, with a helicopter off a Swiss uh, slope. You just go at the back entrance of the shopping center. Um, and then there is really the, the kind of what we call contextual modernism, whereby um, you know, the, 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 there, there has been an attempt in order to make this kind of sensibility civilized, if you like. Um, and, and that is really to do with, with a certain truth, because a, 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 truth is a, a truism, if, if it is a truism indeed, and it's said often enough, cannot be denied anymore. And what happened in the, um, in the time when I was a student, and, and earlier, and, and later through the work of Leon Crea and, and, and uh, other uh, traditional, who, the others who believed in traditional urbanism, it became true that the destruction of the European city, really, a lot of it is to do with the sensibility that you saw in the first slide, which is a complete ignorance of the context, complete ignorance of scale, complete ignorance of, of typology. And, and you see these kind of rather tortured interventions into, into areas which are so rich in culture and in architectural history that there is an attempt at least by, by, by modernists in order to, to, uh, to do that. And what of classicists? You know, they're also as guilty as, as uh, you know, crimes against uh, humanity, if you like. Uh, you know, the, the bottom is, is a villa in Kuwait where we had a project and every conceivable sculpture is actually atop that building. And it is actually a, a nightmare, obviously it's a nightmare, you wouldn't really dream of this if you were a sane person. And, uh, and, and you see how it actually, uh, the, the, the reflection of that into mass culture. Uh, above buildings are villas in China which are mass, which are produced on mass and they are essentially illiterate architecturally you can see you know where the where the where the capital is inboard and the cornice there's no sense of proportion different kinds of architectural iconography are all mixed together and uh, some would call it eclecticism if they want to be extremely kind but actually it's illiterate <coughs> at the end of the day and this is really all to do with the fact that we are a global profession nowadays we practice in different parts of the world but what is happening really is that when we go to a locality uh, we're trying to speak the local, not trying to speak the local language, but mimic the local dialect, but speaking our own language. It's like me coming to Barajas and getting to, into a taxi and speaking English in a Spanish accent, thinking that I'm going to be understood, but you know, I will probably end up in nowhere. And that is actually a lot of the, a lot of the places where this kind of architecture is going. It's going nowhere. Um, and then there is obviously people who are at the forefront of, of, uh, of uh, really trying to pull back, to recalibrate our understanding of what is proper 
uh, uh, and what is classical and how that works. So you, you have, and, and the examples of this are not really just uh, con confined to building. It is actually a, a, a kind of a Weltanschauung. It's a world view. It is a, it's a holistic view. It goes from urban planning, a sense of place, a sense of scale, streets, squares, traditional urban planning, to traditional buildings, to the construction. So it is actually, when you slice the cake, there is every facet of architecture and architectural history and provenance uh, within this kind of tradition. It is not really a kind of a myopic view of what architecture should be. And that actually, in a way, contrary to a lot of uh, uh, misconceptions, gives enormous flexibility to, to architects of, of the classical per uh, persuasion or traditional architects. Whereas you see with modernism, it is just repetition of exactly the same. You know, you see Villa Akbar, you see, uh, um, uh, sorry, Torah Akbar, you see the, 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 uh, the, 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 the shard, et cetera, et cetera, and, and all of them are really about the same kind of sensibility. Um, I'm going very quickly through this, but in, if you were to kind of condense what we or what I think are the main tenets on which we we look at architecture in the office is really to do with the with the division of them between the classical and the vernacular, and these are kind of the attributes, the main attributes with which we 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 look at a building and to see whether it is placed within a vernacular context or whether it is within a classical context, and the classical context uses materials for durability, is responsive to the geoclimatic conditions, but not necessarily so. Um, it represents cultural forms, and not just the functions. It represents values. It may not even have a function. It may be an honorific building. Uh, and it, it is on the site, and it's superimposed. It doesn't necessarily have to follow the, 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 the contingencies of how a site is. And I will explain that. It's aesthetic conveys a discipline tectonic, whereas the vernacular is not necessarily discipline. It's all about being inventive with whatever you can find. And uh, it relies on a certain degree of abstraction of nature uh, in the way stone represents nature, represents foliage, for example, or metal. Whereas with, with, uh, with, uh, with the vernacular, there is no kind of abstraction. It is a straightforward intervention. <coughs> Uh, and it's high tech, obviously, because it uses you know more labor. It uses uh, uh, kind of industrial, quote unquote, techniques. Whereas with vernacular, you use the materials where you find them. They're they're just expedient. You don't have to you know uh, bring uh, uh, tons and hundreds and hundreds of tons of uh, of uh, exotic stone in order to construct a temple or 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 an honorific building. Is obviously born out of the geoclimatic conditions. And it represents cultures of forms, but re which are really related to the functions of the building. So the function, the geoclimatic conditions are really the a priori in, the, in vernacular architecture. And, and it will be interesting to discuss with, with, uh, with Javier really how juxtaposing that into a kind of an honorific situation. In, in the case of Asplon, for example, in the cemetery, how the nature of vernacular changes, whether it is debased or whether it is related to its original conception as as building that's not mediated by architecture, if you like. Um, and uh, the aesthetic of vernacular obviously is, is, is emerging from an innovative and continually adapted culture of, of buildings which are essentially disposable. Vernacular buildings are disposable. They are, they are made to last for a function and they, they, they sort of die and then they're rebuilt again. Um, so we try to explore these kind of things in different kind of buildings that, that we do. Uh, this is like the construction details of, one of a chalet which we have built in the Alps, uh, where you know, the, the, the kind of architecture, the architecture of the building really informs uh, the, 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 the kind of construction techniques of the rafters that have to bear the weight of the snow. The, the, the size of the roof slates, which are you know, usually about six to seven centimeter thick, and they're a meter square, because otherwise snow will pull them off. So all of the aesthetics that arise out of what you see in a Swiss chalet or, or an Alpine chalet is really very directly connected to its function, <coughs> and not necessarily to any kind of cultural significance that it might have, uh, in, uh, which is all secondary. And then really, um, the way the buildings are constructed, that's a shot from one of our buildings in Kuwait, where I'm always fascinated by the way wood scaffold and, and, and the way they're tied together or wrapped around buildings still in the 21st century where 
we're told that you can't really do things like that. And really, in order to just reinforce that idea, and then I very quickly will, will go through some projects, is that <clears throat> you can see already what, what I was trying to say is that really the geoclimatic conditions, the availability of local materials, which tend to be the same in se same climatic uh, territories, they're all the same. You see these gra granaries, there's one in Norway, one in Spain, one in Iran, and one in Japan. And essentially, they follow the same kind of logic. They use the same kind of materials, pretty much, uh, because they're purely to do with the function. And then they, they take, obviously, romantic, they take other kind of aspects to them. The same thing with adobe buildings, uh, that you can see, really, the kind of, the, 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 the principle by which openings can be made into an adobe buildings are really to do with the spanning, uh, uh, capabilities of, of mud and how the, the sizes of the mud brick, etc., etc., and the way they're built. So you can see like the kind of iconography of them being pretty much the same. And really, even with timber framing building, you can see really the, 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 you know, what you find in the UK or Spain, in Turkey and in Germany, where, where the techniques of building with what you find and how you can frame a building has been developed without really any kind of formal. Uh, and then, the idea of classicism really being, the, being, being representative of, of kind of different value systems is what you see. The, here there is really, there may be a, a nod towards what the climate is or what materials you might find, but they're essentially about things which are superimposed. They sit on a, on a, on a stylobate a per, uh, like Persepolis or they are on horrific axes, etc. There's nothing about having to sit something somewhere because you just have to. As in, a, and as in a chalet would sit on a, on a hillside. Um, and how that sort of translates into classical, um, you know, you, from, from the mosques of Cordoba or, or, or San Lorenzo del Escorial in Spain, and different classicisms. The idea of that there is different classicism is it's not just about the kind of Western European uh, Roman or, or Greco Roman classicism. And, you know, that there is certain rules, uh, regulations, proportioning <coughs> systems that exist in all of these architecture that, that has nothing to do with the vernacular, but it is to do with the classical culture of the locality. Oops, sorry. And, yeah, and then just I'll very quickly go through some, some recent projects in the office uh, which try to explore these kind of ideas. Um, this is a replacement building in a row of terraces on a London street in Mayfair. The original building was by James Wyatt, a famous neoclassical, neoclassical Georgian architect uh, of 1746-1813. And he built Salisbury Cathedral, Radcliffe Observatory in Oxford, uh, etc., etc. And the building on that site was demolished. The original building on site was demolished. Uh, a building of uh, this, which we replaced, uh, uh, was proposed because the original building actually, actually didn't really respect the street. It was a one-off building. So we try to follow the same kind of logic. Uh, I'm told I don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to flick through it. <laughs> this, is a, this is a villa in Kuwait where we explored the proportioning systems of what, what one calls, quote unquote, Islamic architecture, whereas that definition is actually quite wide because Islam extends from North Africa right away to China. Uh, and, and it represents itself in various forms of cultural uh, representation as well as architecture. And uh, in terms of the plan, of the, 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 the exploration of the courtyard plan is a kind of a classical architecture. This is a villa in Kuwait, uh, where it, which is centered around a courtyard, a completely enclosed courtyard, and a semi-open <coughs> courtyard. And the kind of exploration of the, of the typologies of, of the openings, uh, the ventilation, <coughs> the kind of construction, it's in solid stone, uh, Syrian stone, uh, with Musharabia and the kind of the court, the semi-open court, which is a sort of a nod to the uh, to to the court in Alhambra, um, and these are just various photographs of the pro of of the project. The, in a complete contrast, this is a chalet in in the Alps where we explored the the kind of vernacular architecture of 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 uh, the area and using the technology. <laughs> the vernacular technology and the technology of the building, uh, the chalets, which is really extremely rational, really. Everything is to do with, with, with how one has to survive in, in, in the mountains. 
the sections of the timbers are all to do with the weight of the stone, with the weight of whatever the roof carries, the stone that sits on the, on the mountain, the way the buildings are different sizes from different angles because they sit on a slope, they don't sit on a flat ground. You cannot flatten the ground and actually build on it. You have to respect the slope of the building. Um, and the, the construction elements, obviously, and also the idea of the picturesque, which is like a second layer. It comes really after the, after the logics that actually give rise to the building. Uh, this is a project in the center of London. It's actually for an apartment building. It's an urban project uh, where we are uh, hoping to insert a classical building in, in place of a 1960s built structure. And this really is to do with, with city building and how you know, urban blocks uh, survive within context and how anomalous things like that are, or things like that are which are intervention in the city, uh, or unsympathetic interventions. This is a, a, another vernacular project. This is a house owned by, by uh, His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales in Romania, which we're actually converting into an international learning center um, uh, for skills for INTBA, which is a, which is a international network of traditional building architecture and urbanism. Um, and it explores really the idea of the farm court and the continuity of the buildings. These are all new buildings in the sketch which are proposed in order to uh, complete the, a, a kind of a half-built semi-open courtyard. Um, and these are some of the other projects. This is a project in central London. And this, this project is actually going to start construction, which Pablo Alvarez is working on. He's here in my office. Um, and, uh, and it's for a major country house in Scotland, um, really exploring the idea of the Scottish vernacular. And that's it, I think. Thank you.